Thank you. Our call to worship this morning. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings of the earth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Sovereign God, come to us now in silent, holy power. Still our distracted minds, our bruised hearts, our longing bodies. Then speak the power of Jesus' name in such a way that we might hear it, in such a way that we might bear it into the world. As a people who seek not to preserve what we know, but to make palpable who you are. For we move and pray by the gift of your breath within us. Amen. Our opening hymn is in the blue hymnals, number 21, This is My Father's World. I do the Old Testament story from over there, but I forgot my mic, so I'll be doing it from up here. Uh, and it's about Hannah's sons and Eli's sons. So if you remember last week, we were introduced to the uh, woman Hannah, who did not have any children, but when she was at Shiloh, the place of sacrifice in the northern kingdom, she prayed for a child, a son, and she was blessed with one. And her uh, prayer was, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you and dedicate him to the temple. So when he had his weaning year, which is about four years old, she took a four-year-old to the temple and left him with the priest in charge, who was Eli. Now, Eli was a good guy. His sons, on the other hand, were not. So in Israel, the priesthood is hereditary. All right, so um, it's not like... Uh, Protestant or other places where 
you are ordained into the priesthood, you're born into it. And so you kind of have job security, whether you're good at it or not. And uh, Eli's two sons, they flaunted the rules. They didn't wait for the meat to be done. They took the best pieces before all the blood was boiled out. Um, so there is a commandment in uh, the uh, law that says that you can't eat meat which still has blood in it. So everybody who likes any steak other than well done, no. All right, so if you like it medium, no. And apparently these boys like their steak medium. And so they would take this, the meat out of the fire before it had reached the well done point. And people would complain and Eli would go, I don't know what to do with them. They're hereby, it's hereditary. What do you want me to do? Meanwhile, he is teaching Hannah's son, Samuel, uh, the little guy, and um, Samuel is, he is a great kid. He does what he's told to do. He has a great attitude. Um, but again, he's four, five, six years old. He's adorable, right? So one night, everybody goes to bed. And Samuel hears a voice saying, get up and, and come to me or something like that. And so he gets up and he runs to Eli and he says, what do you want, Master? What do you want? And Eli says, oh, I didn't call you. Get back to bed, you're having a dream. And it happened a second time. And, we, and Eli, what did you want? And he said, you, you're having dreams. You need to go back. And then Eli thought for a minute. He says, you know what? The next time you hear that, and say those words. Say, Lord, what do you want? Right? And so the next time the voice came and called for Samuel, Samuel said, Lord, what do you want? So he had his first experience of God as a little boy. And we'll look at other parts of his life to find out as an old man, he is the one that uh, um, anoints the first king of Israel, Saul. And he finds David and he anoints him as king, second king. Uh, but he has a long life of service to God. So his mother's prayers were answered. She followed through with her promise. And Samuel became a faithful servant to Yahweh. Our call to confession. Trusting in the power of God not only to fashion the world, but to mend and refashion our hearts. Let us say how it is with us. Please join me in the confession prayer. Holy One, we dare to call you Lord, but yield to you only fragments of our lives. You had nowhere to lay your head. We surround ourselves with comfort. We expect to serve you with what remains after we have indulged our desires. Forgive our greed, our lack of trust, our desire to pick the times and places we will respond to our call. In your abundant mercy, teach us what it means to follow, even at the cost of our lives. Amen. And please have a moment of silence. Beloved of God, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. It cannot be contained, but must be poured out. Believe this good news in Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven. Live as people set free.
We have special music today with our bells, bells and bows. Thank you. That was nice. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. <clears throat> Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. 
But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Please join me for the glory patry. have to stand for the sermon's uh, hymn, but let's do our prayer of illumination. Spirit of truth, move now in ancient words and cluttered hearts that we might hear your voice and live, for we long to be glad servants of your hidden holy reign. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. The Green Hymnal 560 is our next song for the beauty of the earth. One, two, three, and five. lunch bunch we actually had a theological conversation which doesn't happen very often but I'm very glad when it does and we talked about Jesus as the liberator so Jesus like the next Moses so Moses was a liberator he liberated the children of Israel from uh, the Egyptians and established a new kingdom which was an earthly kingdom and then they established rules and laws of how they were to live and be together well this morning uh, we're going to talk about Jesus, the kingdom of truth, that 
that is like the kingdom of Moses, but not like the kingdom of Moses. We call it the kingdom of God. There are, um, when, we look at, when we look at this, we're going to look at Jesus the Liberator, and Jesus the Liberator is an agent of change, which means when Jesus comes into your life, Jesus changes it. That there is a change in how you understand things. There is a change in how you do things. There is a change in how you understand the world. And there is a change in how you understand Christ. So, um, in this particular passage, there are two things that stick out that we need to talk about. One is, my kingdom is not of this world, and the other one is, I came into the world to testify to the truth. So when Jesus says, if my kingdom was of this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But they're not, because my kingdom is not of this world. Which must have made Pilate go, Phew. I don't want to have to put down another revolt. I don't want to have to have people fighting amongst themselves. And I certainly don't have to compete with another kingdom. And uh, when Jesus is speaking about a kingdom, he's actually speaking about a theological kingdom and not a political kingdom. Because he says that those who accept Jesus as the truth both hear and heed his voice. So you remember the sheep that hear the voice of the shepherd to heed and hear his voice proclaim the truth be the truth and belong to the truth that's saying an awful lot about how our orientation to truth becomes these are the things that make him king because his kingdom is not defined in earthly terms but neither is it an ethereal, imaginary concept of something that comes along after you're dead. Jesus comes from and belongs to God's kingdom. Now, sometimes we have a hard time with the statements that his kingdom is not of this world because we either see it as a distant after you die kind of thing, a place where there'll be joyful living, where we'll be there and all the people we hate won't be, right? Or we get confused about the earthly kingdom because our religious name has been co-opted by our country uh, who believe that we're a Christian nation and that what we do is Christian, which is not. And I'll explain that. We know that that isn't true because people are suffering every day and our culture is individualistic and not communal. Uh, oriented. We do not practice what Jesus preached, and as a whole, people are disingenuous and greedy and selfish and cruel. It is a false assumption that we live in a Christian nation, and one we need to stop believing and stop promoting because it only adds to the chaos and prevents us from seeing the world as it really is. And seeing the world as it really is is paramount to bringing the kingdom of God here. We can't bring the kingdom of God here. We can't act as Jesus modeled for us if we don't see the world the way it really is. That's the truth that we have to accept. That we don't want to see the pain and the hurt that our society causes many people. I know we think that we have freedom of religion, and we say that all the time, we have freedom of religion. I don't think we do. I think some people are free to practice their religion and others are not. Because in the last three years, there have been mass shootings in historically black churches, mosques, synagogues, and Sikh temples. Now, where's the freedom of religion there? It's not. Because those people Right? Those people are different. Our culture is toxic. It's more toxic now than I think it's ever been. 
And if you're just even of Asian descent, that can get you killed on the bus or the sidewalk. And protesting can get you killed too. And now I want to talk about the kingdom of God and Kyle Rittenhouse. And I think that we need to pray for him. He was acquitted of all charges. But that doesn't make him innocent. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't have to live for the rest of his life knowing that he has taken two lives. And I don't know if he'll ever figure out that he, has been, that he was abused and that's why it happened. He was told by the grown-ups around him that it was okay to shoot other people. He was given a gun. He was taught to aim and shoot. He was taught to hunt humans that weren't like him. He was praised and is praised by right-wing pundits like Matt Gates and Madison Cawthorn and Paul Gosser who say, I'm going to give him a job as an intern because he's a great American. He's a great patriot because he shot protesters. But I don't see anybody helping him deal with what he did. He's getting all kinds of kudos. But I worry about his soul and his heart and his psyche. Because when you take another life, it, it takes something from you. So, we are finding that many right-wing Christians, and they call themselves Christians, and I would argue that, but they do, think that this kind of behavior in training the young to kill people who are not like them is okay. My husband was reading the other day, and he was reading where this one guy was uh, interview, and he says, well, I just can't wait till we can start shooting Democrats. And I'm like, wow, that's great. That's how we're going to solve our problem. We're just going to be shot. So um, this kind of behavior that, that molded Kyle Rittenhouse is not part of the kingdom of God. And I want to say that neither necessarily are liberal Democrats part of God's kingdom either. It's not one or the other. It's what you do. It's how you behave. And it's who's in your heart, not what cards you carry in your wallet. It is gut-wrenching and mind-numbing to think that Kyle is not the last kid that gets indoctrinated into this garbage. Because there, there are going to be more. Now Jesus as liberator, right? Jesus as the agent of liberation, tells us that we have to look at the truth of our society to actually change it that we have to understand who was being hurt and how we're participating in that hurt and stop participating. If you think about Jesus as a liberator or Moses as a liberator, when you have the story of the Good Samaritan, right? You guys know that story, right? The Good Samaritan. And most of us will identify with the Good Samaritan in that story. But in liberation theology, when Jesus is the agent of change, we identify with the victim, with the guy in the gutter. And we see the story from that perspective. And then it changes, it changes how we understand reality. So perspective and empathy depend from what angle you are looking at. Now, it's not possible for all of us to look from every angle and understand every situation completely. We can't do it. We're human. But we can acknowledge that there are other ways to look at something, and we can begin to understand 
what other people go through, and we can read, and we can educate ourselves, and we can get to a better place than we are now. Because Jesus pushes us as an agent of change. Jesus promotes reality. He doesn't say that it needs to stay reality. He says this is what it really is, and it's not the kingdom of God. And now what are we going to do to change that and invites us to be co-creators of the kingdom of God with him? To know and to seek God is to be an active witness on a journey to God. So it's not like we wait till we get somewhere and do it. This is our journey to God. Jesus' life and mission is a model for us. So when we read the Gospels and we see what Jesus does, then that's what we should do. In Jesus, we learn that truth is a stimulant for faithful living and witness rather than just a matter of contemplation. It's more than what we believe, it's what we do, it's how we process information, and it's how we make it manifest in our lives. Dorothy Sorrell, a German liberation theologian who coined the term Christofascism, uh, cautions us against seeking truth under the authoritarian model of obedience. So I was raised under the authoritarian model of obedience, which is Jesus said it and that settles it. Don't ask any questions. Yes, love your neighbor, except if they're, and fill in the blank, because there's a whole category of people that you weren't supposed to love, that you were supposed to hate. And this is the way it was, and you needed to be obedient to God. Well, that kind of obedience to an authoritarian model not only keeps you from growing in your Christianity, it keeps you from seeing God. So she suggests that instead of having this being blind to the world and, and ultimately blind to God, that we seek God in all situations to figure out what God's will is in any given place, any given time, and then do it. Now that sounds easy, but it takes a lot of contemplation and a lot of prayer and a lot of thought Um, one of the examples of the authoritarian model is Westboro Baptist Church. Do you remember them? They would go to um, soldiers' funerals and picket how the U.S. was going to hell in a handbag because they allowed gay people in the military. Pardon? They just will tell you that. Um, that's authoritarian model of obedience. And it prevents them from seeing the world, and it prevents them from seeing God. So, obedience that has us wide, eyes wide open discovers God's will in a situation. It's where freedom, change, and spontaneity come together. It's where we can seek to be a part of God's kingdom in the here and the now. It gives us agency as Christ is given agency. And it's what transforms the world. One community at a time. It's not necessarily an individual transformation. It's a transformation of communities at a time. So God's kingdom, the one Christ modeled, is the truth, the truth of God's love among a broken people, and we are a broken people. The reign of God is larger than any individual. The kingdom is present wherever Jesus is present. Wherever we experience the reign of God, through God's invitation, God's healing, and God's restoration. Jesus, like Moses, liberates us from bondage. And we will live in God's kingdom when we 
accept Jesus as the liberator and a, a look for that agent of change in our lives to really look at the community, to really look at our world, and to find the will of God and do it. Would you pray with me? Holy God, our Father and Mother, we thank you so much for all the things that you have given us and for the things that you have taken away. We thank you for your message to us, whether we are living in the estranged and reconciliation world of Jesus, or the uh, benevolence and reform world, or the oppression and liberation world, or the sin and redemption world. We know that all these worlds are only partially showing us how you work in humanity. We will never see fully in the glass until we are with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Time for our joys and concerns this morning. A prayer of thanksgiving for our church and church family. Also for Mike. We pray for your hand of comfort and care of those dealing with long-term health issues and their families. Lynn Partlow, Bonnie and Andrea, the Dumas family in quarantine and several members of the family are being treated with COVID as well as others in our communities who are suffering from COVID currently and those who have ongoing issues because of it. We continue to pray for Janeria and Janine. You know our needs, O Lord, spoken and unspoken. Be with all who need love and support this day. I also need to add Bernie Savage and Bob Capen. And do I have any other joys or concerns, Hamer? The Rios family. And Caitlin. Caitlin? Okay. Is he in the hospital, Caitlin, or is he at home? Okay. Okay. Anyone else, Dave? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Anyone else? No. So we will pray for all these concerns spoken and those that are silent on our hearts. And we pray, Holy God, we do not know how to pray, but Jesus invites us into the life he shares with you. And so we keep coming because we want to live. Receive us now in our frailty, our complacency, our desire. We pray for your church all over the world. May the life we discover in you bind us to each other and to the world you love. For no need is beyond the strength of your call, and no child of yours is expendable. Merciful God, give us wisdom and courage beyond our imagining. We pray for each leader who might be an instrument of peace in a troubled land. By the movement of your reconciling spirit, bless your people with the courage to re reach past old wounds and persistent fears. God of resurrection, bring life where hope has died. We pray for friends and strangers in the grip of addiction. Make us able companions for each other and bless us with hope that bears fruit. We pray for unsettled economies and those whose needs are overlooked in the choices of the powerful. May we who know so much privilege bear our responsibilities with open eyes and open hands. We pray for all who stand at the thresholds of life, your children who are soon to be born and your children who are soon to go home. We give thanks for the new faces of love, ideas to ponder, work to do, and we marvel at the sturdy friendships and persistent me memories that sustain us when the way is hard. May each be a reminder of your love and your provision. We thank you for the gift of song, 
for notes that speak when words fail, in choirs that practice at the end of long days. Give strength to leaders who call forth the best from us and invite us to breathe together. Holy One, keep calling us into the world, your world, as salt and light. Equip us, equip you, equip each of us for the challenges we will face until we learn to worship in the most unlikely places. For you are the source of our song and the well from which we pray, wherever we are planted. By the power of your spirit, we make our prayer with resurrection hope in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let us speak the prayer that Jesus taught us. So join me in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we worship the one who stands at the beginning and at the end of history, the God for whom all time is now. Every day we have a chance to participate in the work God is doing in the world. By bringing our gifts each week, by offering our lives each day, we affirm our trust in a power beyond violence, beyond greed. Let us gladly offer who we are and what we hold in service to God. Please join me in the doxology. Holy God, the psalmist declares that in your realm all the poor are satisfied with bread. Plant that promise firmly in our hearts that we might be agents of your covenant love. Use these gifts, shape our desire until hunger is no more. For Jesus taught us to seek our neighbor's daily bread. And we pray by the power of his name. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the green hymnal, number 563, verses 1 to 3.
and who was and who is to come. The Almighty be your strength, your hope, and your joy this day and forevermore. And let us close with our threefold amen.